Good morning, Renew. There we go. <laughs> you know, I, I, I first have to say this. I am so grateful that we have a worshiping church. You know, you guys don't get to experience this, but I was standing back there, and to hear on that last song especially the voices resonate. It's just something about this room. All the voices just project, and they go down these two hallways. And man, I almost couldn't come out because I was tearing up. So I just love that. And because I, I love that because a singing church shows that we're connected and that we're all here for a purpose. And we don't care what the world thinks because we're here because God called us to be here together as a family. So I love that. And I just wanted to give you all that for a moment. So my name is Chris. We have some new faces here. I'm part of the preaching teaching team here. I'm also the men's ministry director. And as always, I want to thank you guys for being here. It's a pleasure to see you. Know that your hearts were prayed for, your presence were prayed for to be here, and also our online community as well. You were prayed for too. And even though you aren't here with us, we hope to see you soon. So, who really enjoyed Spencer's sermon last week? Let's be honest for a moment. What? Come on. <laughs> Y'all don't make me look bad. <laughs> I did. I really enjoyed Spencer's sermon last week. And you know, here's the thing is that as I listened to him preach and talk and teach, one thing that stuck out for me, and maybe it stuck out for you, was this idea of follow me. Did that stick out to you guys? More importantly, it was this idea of um, not only follow me, but who are you following? Better yet, who's following you? And it got me thinking, you know, following is just a part of human nature. And especially nowadays, followers and following is more prevalent than ever. Thanks to social media, you know, things like Facebook, Twitter Sphere, Snaptogram, or whatever these things are that everybody's doing, right? But here's the thing, that following helps us stay connected. It helps us stay together. In those forms, in that media, in that content, we, we can kind of stay connected with each other. We understand that what's going on in each other's lives, and we can reach out, and we can, and we can talk, and it's just an amazing thing if you think about it. And so following, this idea of following is not only necessary, but it's timely in this day and age. However, there's this, maybe some of you don't, aren't aware of this, there's this whole other subculture that's emerging amongst the followers. It's a group of individuals who are setting the bar for What's cool, what's relevant, what's popular, what's politically correct, and sometimes what's politically incorrect or incorrect. And we call these people influencers. Are y'all familiar with that? Yeah. You know, I I just have to I have to go back for a minute and think. So do y'all remember last Sunday um, when Spencer had us doing the hokey pokey? You know, raise your hand if. Who remembers that? Yeah. And so it got me thinking. I'm not sure if it was Spencer's intent or Holy Spirit's intent. But I wonder how many of us looked around and we saw someone stand in response to one of those questions and thought, I'll just use myself as an example. Hey, I noticed Chris raised his hand when Spencer said, who here struggles with temptation? Now before you gasp. You have to remember what followed next. So I wonder who who saw that and said, hmm. But then immediately after, Spencer asked another question. You know, basically, how many of you have struggled with temptation, struggled with temptation, and, and can beat it? And Chris stood up. Did you think for a moment, if that was you in that situation, if they can, I can? See, I think unknowingly, standing in response to those questions, we may have unconsciously or consciously impacted others in our life. We may have influenced them merely by our actions, our bravery, our boldness to be vulnerable in that moment. And in doing so, maybe we encouraged and influenced somebody to take the next steps to connect here with somebody, as Spencer directed last week, 
where they were struggling in something. They needed improvement in, in their prayer life. They needed joy in their life. They needed to, to reconnect with people more. Maybe we influence them to start that, to take that next step, to connect. Or maybe reconnect with a God-given purpose. See, I believe that God is asking us not only to follow, but to influence. To be holy influencers. To be set apart from the world. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.20 says this, this, Therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. Man, there's just something powerful about that. God is calling you. God is calling you to be an ambassador for him, a partner with him. You know, this ambassador of Christ is what Paul calls, uh, you know, or is what we would call an influencer nowadays. That's essentially what it is. You know, and an ambassador in, in its typical form is this, an authorized representative or messenger. Uh, the Latin origin of that word is ambaxis or ambactus, meaning servant or minister. Now, isn't that interesting? I bet you never really considered that's what ambassador meant. But today I'd like to look at how we can be influencers. By looking at the lifestyle and the spiritual disciplines of Jesus. And see where we can or how we can adjust our lives to follow him better. So that we can be holy influencers for Jesus. You know, I often say, and maybe you've heard me say it a hundred times, but I'm going to continue to do it because I think this is an an issue for most of us, is that we overcomplicate our faith. We think too hard about it. We want want to resolve it and answer questions in ourselves instead of look to God for that. And so I'm convinced that there is some confusion in what it means to be a Christ follower. Now, Spencer laid out a really good road for us. And if you didn't hear that sermon, you need to go back and look at it. But even sometimes when we have that path in front of us, we get busy, we don't look at it, or we forget it. So we're going to touch on that a little bit today. And so I believe there's some confusion in what it means to be a Christ follower. We need to, in order to to understand that, we need to go back and look at what a Christ follower is called. We're called Christians. And why are we called Christians? You know, first I want to clear up some things too, is that you're not a Christ follower because you're born in America. You're not a Christ follower because you went to seminary. You're not one because you were raised in a religious home. You're not one because you said a special prayer or you were dunked in a bathtub of water or you only agree that Jesus was a good moral teacher. While some of those are great qualities and responsibilities of Christians, these things don't guarantee you are a Christ follower. They just simply don't. Hear me out. A person becomes a Christian by choosing to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior, trusting trusting in His death on the cross to be completely sufficient for their forgiveness and their reconciliation to God. There is never Jesus and. There is only Jesus. This is a Christ follower. And this is where we start to be influencers. So in order to really understand what the task at hand is, we we need to go back. We need to go back and remember where we came from, to know who we are. Did you know that Christian is only used three times? The word Christian is only used three times in all of Scripture. It's usually found found in the New Testament, Acts 11.26, Acts 26.28, and 1 Peter 4.16, if you wanted to go look at that. So we have to try to understand what did it mean to be a Christian. So we go back to the beginning, where that word was first used. And so to do that, I have to give you some history. I promise you it won't be boring. (laughs) 
So about 2,000 years ago, in Antioch is where we find this word emerge. Antioch is found in Syria, uh, in Turkey area, about 300 miles, uh, of, about 300 miles north of Jerusalem, 30 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea. It's a strong, large city. The people are renowned for their sarcasm, their cynicism, their wickedness. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Much like Rome and Alexandria were. You know, all three of these cities were very powerful and wealthy, wealthy cities, uh, very large cities, but they were also very sinful cities. And so what we see here pick up in Acts 11 is about approximately 12 years after the ascension of Christ. Scripture tells us that believers were preaching and they were teaching. There were many conversions to the faith. But there's also a great need for leadership. And so they sent for Paul. You know, can you imagine that? A revival in a moment where there's so much going on. People are giving them their self to Christ. They're learning about God's word and, uh, and they're learning their new identity in Christ that we have to send out for other leaders. Hey, I need your help. Come in. So Paul arrives and reinforces the teachings for an entire year. And more conversions ensue. More people give themselves to God. So Acts 11.26 simply says this. It says, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And here's what I want you to pay attention to. It says here, And in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. Now think about that for a moment didn't say disciples called themselves Christians. Think about where they're at. I just painted the picture for you. They're in the midst of a wicked, sinful city. And it says, in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Man, my mind was blown when I really started thinking about this. Up until this point, no disciple or follower of Jesus was ever called a Christian in all of text or scripture. At least I can't find an account for it. So, this idea of being called, pay attention to that little word that says the disciples were first called Christians. I need you to understand that too. In Hebrew and Greek, to be called or a call can be used in the sense of a naming someone. And in a biblical thought, to give a name to something or someone was to give an identity. It's like, I'm Chris, but I'm an engineer. I'm Chris, but I'm a preacher and teacher. I'm called that. Names were often encapsulated as a message in an effort to describe what a person was concerned about or doing in their life. So this idea of being called literally means what business you were into. And it's used to describe simply who you are and what relationship you have with the people around you. Better yet, what business or thing you're known for. So let's look at this. How was it used? So called literally means what business you were in. And it was used to describe you in your everyday life. This is why people are called, back then were called Caesareans. Because they followed Caesar. That, I, that I-A-N-S is that idea of being called. Or Platoans because they followed the beliefs and the teaching of Plato. But here's something else I need you to understand. It wasn't in that time to be called something and to be called a Christian by the Antioch uh, community was not necessarily a compliment. And I already told you that that community was full of cynicism and sarcasm. They, They basically looked at the disciples and the believers of Christ and said, Oh, you're not like us. But why? Why aren't you like us? And simply, these men and women just responded, because Jesus. 
well, you don't talk like us. You don't dress like us. You don't act like us. But you act, dress, look, teach, love, and live like this man you call Christ. So we're going to call you Christians. You know, it just makes sense that the the culture of Antioch at that time would use that word to name Christ followers and to call them Christians. You know, we get our name from a culture. Think about this. We get our name from a culture who is absent of a relationship with God, with the creator of the universe, who watched our lives so closely and essentially said, you are so noticeably like Christ, like Jesus, and his ways, we are going to say you are about his business and call you Christians. Isn't it amazing? An amazing realization to, 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 to hear that the first century church did not call themselves Christians. It was an unbelieving world that saw that they were so about their father's business that they decided to call them by the man they followed. Christians. They looked like Jesus, they lived like Jesus, they talked like Jesus, they taught like Jesus, and they loved like Jesus. It was unmistakable who they modeled their life after or whose business they were about. From the beginning, believers who followed Jesus were called Christians by the world, insult or not. The lives of these men and women stood out and made such an impact on the culture around them that that culture was aware that there was something uniquely different about them. You could say that early Christians influenced the unbelieving world by the way they lived. However, here we are about 2,000 years later and What's happened over the past few years? Think about it. Generally speaking, it would seem that the church has kept the name Christian, but have reduced following Jesus to a swipe through social media, checking his Instagram every now and then just to see if he's posted a picture of him on the beach or... Whatever he ate that day. Or reduced to a vague comment or an emoji or thumbs up or heart. It just seems to me that there are so many that call themselves Christians with little to no evidence to the outside world that they are actually following Christ. Now hear me, hear me, church. Hear me, hear me, hear me, please. Today, unlike the first century church, we have to call ourselves Christians. We need to get back to our heritage. You hear what I'm saying? We need to get back to our heritage where we are so uniquely different that the world stands up and says, they are so like Jesus They live like Jesus, they talk like Jesus, they love like Jesus, they give like Jesus. They are so like Jesus, they are Christians. It's time to change. We talk about it all the time, we talk about revival. But maybe revival starts here, knowing who we are. Knowing who God called us to be, the purpose he has put us in for. It's time to change. (laughs) Maybe it's time for us to get back to camel hair jackets and eating locusts and honey and yelling from the top of our lungs. Just maybe. Maybe. Do you remember 
Maybe it's time to do whatever it takes to get a little crazy. To bring and point others to Jesus in everything we do. To be like the first Christians. To do, behold, behold the Son of God. There he is. To be like the first Christians, to follow Jesus so intensely that we influence others to do so as well. That we live unashamed, unapologetic, like Paul talks about in Romans 1 verse 16. To love one another, love others regardless of where they're at. To glorify him and praise him with everything we are. Psalms you know, 146 two says this, and I love it. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to God while I have my being. And that's exactly what I thought about as I stood back there and I listened to this church open their lungs and sing praises to the Lord. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says in John 13, 35, he says, and by all this... People will know that you are my disciples. We have to get back to influencing people. So what? Why is this important? Where do we go from here? Look, Spencer did a great job. He woke me up. And I hope he did you too. But here's the thing is that God loves the world, but the world doesn't always love him. That makes our job more important, wouldn't you say? I do. He desires everyone to be saved and enter into eternal life. And I need you to think about that for a moment. If you're a believer or a non-believer, I need you to... God's Word says that about you, even if you don't have a relationship with Him. He desires for you to enter into eternal life connected to Him. Matter of fact, 1 Timothy 2.4 says, He, God who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look, Christianity is quickly emerging amid governmental systems and cultures that do not embrace or support it. The church now more than ever, and I am convinced this is why Spencer started talking about Matthew and Jesus' pursuit and following The church now more than ever needs to choose to live as authentic, biblical Christians and stand up and stand out in the midst of a world that may not understand or even approve of our lives and not care. This is the key purpose of a Christian's life is to live and surrendered obedience to our captain, to Jesus Christ, to follow Christ, to imitate Christ, to be a Christian, more importantly, influence others as they see Christ live out and live in us through us, ultimately working to multiply others and bring them to him. That is our job. In that we we have to work with grace and love and show the world that the Christian way of life, the Jesus way of life, is the best way of life possible. And the promise is in his word. You remember Jesus said he came so his followers may have life and they may have it more abundantly. It's John 10.10. I love this too. He says in 1 Timothy 4.8, he gave Paul the words. He says, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. I don't want to sugarcoat things. It takes work. We talk about that, but do you really know? It takes work. And Paul's saying bodily training is good, but We need to be about God's business. We need to be about Christ's business just as a first century church. Here, you can be the strongest man, the strongest woman in the entire, the smartest one in the entire world. But if you don't have the knowledge and the wisdom of God in Christ by your side, then you will be defeated and taken out every time. 
we have to get back to our heritage. We have to get back to who we were first called to be. If you get over all that, God says that living with him has great benefits. I know that. I know some of you do. Also, you know, this idea is that God has a way of giving us these benefits in our life where we can have these pleasures forevermore. Um, in scriptures, it actually says in Psalm 16, I love that. It says, you make known to me my path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy at your right hand or pleasures forevermore. Without God, we don't have love, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, self-control. We don't have power. We don't have strength. And whether you want to hear it or not, we don't have family. The Christian way of life is the best way of life to live. And we have to convince others to that by the way we choose to live. Like I said, that doesn't mean that Christian living is easy. The challenges and difficulties of this way of life are designed to help us grow. Hear me. They're designed to help us grow to have Jesus' mindset and the character of God as we go about his, birth, his work and his business. Because that's the only way we can do it. You know, that's that whole idea of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Not I can do them because I know Jesus. I have to have the mindset of Christ to do his work, to be about his business. So people can look at me and say, you are so uniquely different. What's the story? We are to learn to think and act like our Father because He wants us to be His children forever and He wants us to bring others who are lost to Him. You know, I'm going to bring this up because I think this helps us understand, and it's probably a pretty controversial verse, but I'm going to try to get through it real quick. But Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24 through 25, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's break that down real quick. Desire to come after me sounds kind of cool, doesn't it? Your sins are forgiven. But there's an option still there, heaven or hell. Deny himself means deny selfish wants and demands of being served and not serving. But what happens more often is that people choose comfort, ease, indulgence. They don't understand, and they, and they don't understand that saving their own life is losing. What about that hard part that says, take up your cross? I'm convinced that we use that wrong all the time. Like something happens to us and we say, that's my cross to bear. That's not what Jesus meant. Maybe that's another sermon, but that's not what Jesus meant. The cross is an executionary device. What Jesus is telling you is take all those things that keep you from being connected to me and stick them to the cross so you can see me. Take up your cross. That's beyond denying That's now dying to yourself. That's what Jesus is asking. Just like deny himself, just like comfort, ease, indulgence is saving yourself and you're losing eternal life in the process. When you take up your cross, you're now dying to self and losing your life is finding. It's finding yourself. Knowing who God intended you to be. Created you for purpose. And this last part, you know, follow me, my example. Jesus says, follow me. This is my example. See me. Put me first. I love, I love that Colossians 1.17. It's been a big thing for me here lately. You know, it's, it's he is before and goes before all things. He is the thing that holds all things together. If he is not at the forefront of our life, then we're bound to get off track. He goes on to say, follow me, my example, my lifestyle, my spiritual disciplines. Be about my business is what Jesus is saying. Learn from me. Imitate me. Multiply me and others. Be a Christian not by label, but by your life. 
just as those early Christians were. By now, I hope some of you recognize the need to adjust your lives. I know I do. I constantly question it sometimes. To get back to following Jesus the way he intended us to. Unfortunately, some of those those ideas or those things are either blatantly obvious or subtly deceptive like this. Maybe you said, I desire Jesus, but I don't deny myself. Maybe you said, "Um, I'm not dying to self. I've been saving my life. But like I said, I'm losing it in the process. My world is falling apart. Maybe you're learning. Maybe you're consuming Scripture like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Like so many people are. You're consuming Scripture. You're learning. But you're not imitating. You're not multiplying. Those are things that we have to get away from. Denying oneself is not a call to lead a colorless life, church. I need you to understand that. Denying oneself is not a call to lead a colorless life. Rather, a call to deny our natural tendencies and pursue something higher. Pursue something higher to which our King Jesus points to us in the way of his life. And for us to share with others. Jesus calls us not to be just followers, but to be holy influencers. Modern day disciples. Living and breathing. We talk about it all the time, but let's do it. Scripture says we have the ability to do it. I just shared with you the fruits of the Spirit that come with it. Paul tells young Timothy that he has the power of Christ within him to do those things. Philippians 4.13, we talked about all those things. Paul says we're, we're more than conquerors. Paul calls us ambassadors, influencers. 2 Corinthians 5.20, Paul just says it again. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That is our job. But it starts with following first. So now what? We have to change our perspective. I'm a big proponent that following Jesus is an adventure. And adventures aren't always easy. No, they're not. God expects us to come up to speed and be ready for the real game. We never attract people, family. We never attract people to God by lowering the bar of expectations of what it means to be a Christian. Being a Christian, once again, is serious business. God didn't design us to live on the sidelines. He didn't die on the cross for us to spend 10 minutes a day with him thinking about him. He didn't design us or create us and all our strengths and intelligence, our fierceness, our giftedness, only for us to be sitting in our comfortable homes, in our comfortable neighborhoods, in our lovely churches, in our sanitized groups of friends. He didn't create us for that, guys. From the beginning, believers who followed Jesus were called Christians, hear me out, by the world. There was something uniquely and distinctively different about them. We have to get back that. We are called to be disciples. We are called to follow. We are called to be influencers. We are called to be ambassadors. We are called to be more than conquerors. We are called to be adventurers on a cosmic scale with the one who set and maintained this tiny rock in motion. I get it. I get it. It's easy to take the off-ramp sometimes. It's easy to take the off-ramp in following Jesus. You know, we settle for, we can settle quickly for a lifeless cultural Christianity over life-giving, fierce, adventurous following of Jesus Christ. It sneaks up on us. I get it. Gosh, I get it. But there's no adventure, reward, or affirmation in any of that. We have to understand where we come from, where we were, what we were built for. We have to recapture and reconnect that idea that our predecessors, 
before us had. They, just like our Lord and Savior said it when he was a young boy, they were about their father's business. So how do we do that? I don't know, maybe we put it in terms of this. We say, well, how, how do we engage a world that may not want to be engaged and say, what's up with you? Well, here, here's the thing. I have to go back to what Spencer laid out. Is that, first and foremost, we need to remember that Jesus, like I said, we overcomplicate things. Jesus' constant invitation throughout his ministry was just simply what? Follow me. Follow me. Let me show you. We can't neglect the invitation. But in order to stay there and do that, we have to have, like I said earlier, the mindset of Christ. Philippians 2.5 says that exactly. It says, have this amongst yourself, amongst yourself which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have the mind amongst yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus. I don't know if that's, that's, that's amazing that we can have the mindset of our Lord and Savior. We have to observe. And how we observe is we learn. We read His Word. We hold His Word in our heart. We have to walk. We have to adjust our lives. That's that idea of Ephesians 4.1. I love that idea. I put it in terms of like this. For me, when I started my journey, it was live your brand. God called me God called me to be his son, to be an heir to the kingdom of heaven, to follow my captain, my warrior king, Jesus. I have to live that brand. If I profess it with my mouth, if I come here on Sundays and I don't live it and nobody can tell it, then what am I doing? Then we have to pattern our lives, meaning we have to live like the, the first century church. We have to live in such a way that people understand there is something different about you, that we influence the way they talk, the way they think, the way they act, the way they spend their time, the way they spend their money, the way they treat each other, the way they, <laughs> the way they dealt with temptation, the way they dealt with lack of joy, the way they, all those things that we learned about last week. We have to do this. And when we do this, people will know that our lives are influenced by Christ because we are living our life and we are loving in such a way that people know that we're so obedient and so surrendered to the man who called us his own. We have to live our love and our obedience for Jesus out loud, family out loud. Once again, yeah, I know following God isn't always easy, but it's always an adventure. It's daring, it's tiring, it's grimy, it's honorable, it's a war, it's a love story, it's, a, it's dangerous at times, it's all these things. It's an adventure and it takes dedication and preparation. Please do not get weary. It takes fierce men and fearless women who so closely follow Christ that the world stands up and says, you remind me of somebody. The world stands up and notices the influence that we have and says, look at those Christians. I want to follow like them. Family, if there's no adventure excitement in your Christianity, you're not following Jesus. So don't get discouraged. Find somebody, like Spencer said. Let's help each other. 2 Corinthians 5.20 once again says that we are just ambassadors. We are ambassadors. It is our job, and I cannot stress that we are influencers, holy influencers is what Paul's saying. So here's my invitation for you today. As we join communion, it's, I want you to think about, you know, have you followed Jesus' will? Have you made excuses? And if you have, that's okay. 
whether you're a believer or a non-believer, I've got this for you. If you have ever thought there must be something more adventurous, fulfilling, rewarding, satisfying, exciting, and daring in your life, you are the next one to be called an influencer. Non-believer or not. To be a disciple, to follow Jesus. You will find once you surrender, your mind opens up to His Spirit, His love, His life. And the possibilities for you will grow immensely. And you will live and you will love and you will laugh and you will have joy that's unmatched by anything that the world could ever give you. So today, just do that as you go to communion. God, I may not know you well, but I invite you in. Help me to influence the world for you. And for my believers out there, some of you that are maybe sitting on the bench, get off the bench. Let's run the race well. And for those that are off the bench and on the field, let's keep working. Let's keep loving. Let's keep living so uniquely, so differently, that the world stands up and says, I want to follow them because there's something special about them. If you'll pray with me. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to stand in your glory. Lord, we know that there are so many things about us that aren't worthy of that. But God, you sent your son to make us worthy of that, to cover us in his righteousness, to put us in reconciliation with you. So Lord, I pray that you equip everyone and anyone here in this church today, believers and non-believers alike, to have their eyes and their ears open to the possibilities that you have put before us. To walk strongly in your word. To walk strongly in your faith. To exemplify the love and the compassion and the grace of your son Jesus Christ in our words, in our actions, whether it be at work or whether it be at church or whether it be home or whether it be in our family. God, equip us. Help us to be holy influencers. And Lord, for those that are just not sure yet, my prayer is that you continue to work in their hearts. And I pray that you continue to chip away at the stone to reveal that heart of flesh and let them seek true adventure, true purpose, true meaning, and true identity that rests in your son Jesus Christ and let each and every one of us who are doing it and doing it well, help them along the way to be holy influencers. And I pray this in Jesus' name.